everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Humane Ed Live today. I'm going to take my mask off so you can all hear me better. We wanted to film this outside, but it's pretty cold and windy today, so I don't think you'd be able to hear me very well. But hopefully you can hear me today. What we're going to be talking about today is how we can um, be the best neighbors to the wildlife that live around us in our yards, um, and also a bit about how we can be um, good neighbors to the, our wildlife neighbors who live further away, um, like in the Amazon rainforest. But um, we share this planet with so many beautiful, intelligent, emotional animals that have families to provide for just like we do. So it's really important that we respect their space and we give them the space that they need to thrive, just like we want for ourselves and our own families. So ways you can help your wildlife neighbors in your backyard are by um, growing a bee or bird friendly garden. Um, and you do that by planting flowers that are rich in pollen and nectar so that they can get all the food and nutrients they need and go on to pollinate more plants. You can hang bird feeders in your yard. Um, of course, sometimes having bird feeders out and food out can lead to other pests like raccoons and squirrels being in your yard. If that starts to become an issue, I just having um, bird friendly gardens is super awesome for them too. So you could take them down if it started to become a problem. You'll want to keep your gardens and your yard pesticide, insecticide, and herbicide free. Um, there are so many insects uh, that help your garden grow and be healthy and that eat the bugs that tend to destroy your garden. So it's really important that you keep those guys alive and thriving because they'll really help you out in the long run. You'll also want to make sure to keep your cats indoors for their own safety and also for the safety of all the animals and bugs that live outside. If you want to um, get your cat some outdoor time, because a lot of cats do love to be in the outdoors, you can build or buy an enclosure uh, like this one here um, that they could use. We have them at our shelter. We call them catios and a lot of the cats really love it. There are other types like, um, not like this one that you could put like on the grass. So just do a little research if that's something you're interested in. There are tons of options out there. So then some solutions for uh, what to do when an animal makes a home in your yard or when raccoons or skunks or an animal like that um, like try to destroy a garden or your yard or something like that. If a bunny makes a nest of baby bunnies in your yard, that can be a little tricky, but um, just make sure that you don't move the nest because if you do, even if you move it like a foot away, the mama's gonna abandon it. She's gonna be very confused. So what you'll wanna do is either leave it alone if there's no um, predator or risk of them being injured in your yard, you'll just leave them alone or you could build a little like enclosure around them. Um, if you can't see, this is just like the type of fencing that you put around a garden to keep pests out. Um, it could keep your dog out as well. Just make sure that you use something that has uh, a hole at the bottom so that the mama can fit in and go back to her babies and get them the nutrients and everything that they need. Don't leave food or water out for them if they made a nest in your yard. That will just likely attract other predators um, and you don't want them to be injured by a skunk or a raccoon or something. If you have a dog that uses your yard and who likes to chase animals like bunnies or like hunt them or something like that. Really the best thing that you can do is for a few weeks, just keep your dog on a leash in your backyard. Um, it might not be your favorite thing to do or your dog's favorite thing to do, but it's just a couple weeks and it will keep them safe. So it's really important. If you have other animals in your yard, like raccoons or skunks or something that's hidden into your garden um, or wrecking your landscaping or something, you can try motion sensor lights. A lot of these animals are spooked by sudden movement or something like a light switching on, so they likely wouldn't uh, come back too often if there was a motion sensor light going off. You could try a scarecrow, the tried and true um, solution. If you have a garden where raccoons or squirrels or something are eating all of your plants and all of the fruits of your labor, um, you can try using solutions like putting pepper in water or hot sauce in water and spraying that on your plants. That just is a taste repellent. It makes it not taste very good to the animals. Um, most of the time they wanna eat your, your plants to get some water out of it. Um, so spraying that kind of stuff will deter them from using that as their water source. 
Uh, you could also try leaving out like a little Tupperware or something full of water so that they can try to get water that way instead of having to bite into your plants. Um, but yeah, so that's how you can protect the animals in your backyard. Now we'll talk a little bit about um, like larger scale habitat destruction that is occurring as a result of human activities. So like deforestation up here, um, there are massive, massive sections of forests that are being destroyed every single day to make room for cattle grazing and for giant monocrop fields. And that of course destroys the habitat for so many animals that now need to go find a new place to live. Um, and of course it also reduces the amount of oxygen that we have in the air. So, um, Trees and plants, of course, make oxygen for us, and if we tear them all down, we're not going to have very clean, breathable air. And things like monocrops uh, tend to really uh, take out all of the nutrients in soil and make it really hard to continue growing nutrient um, produce in those fields. And they also generally require a lot of pesticide, herbicide, and insecticide use. And the more you use pesticides and insecticides and all that, um, the more you'll end up needing. It's not a end all situation using pesticides because you'll just end up having to use more and more until it becomes dangerous for your health and it destroys your plants and the animals living around it. Um, wildfires are another huge thing that's going on that are, um, the intensity of them is like partially caused by human activity. So fires are a natural and super important part of a forest life cycle. They clear out dead leaves and trees and competing vegetation so that new life can grow. So it's super important. However, the intensity and frequency of these fires are, you know, increased by um, human activity and climate change. And researchers have found that in the past like 40 years, the number of days that are um, perfect conditions for wildfires, days that are dry, hot and windy, um, those, the amount of days in a year have um, doubled since the 1980s. So we have way more days every single year um, where there's a huge risk of wildfire and of those fires being really hard to put out. So ways that you can um, make a difference and try to reduce environmental de uh, degradation are planting a garden in your yard or using a community garden space. Um, or buying local foods if you don't have the space to make your own garden. Um, this just helps reduce the uh, your carbon footprint by, um, it, it requires less transportation if the food is local or from your own yard. Um, but generally, if it's locally purchased food, it, they're not um, produced using monocrops, so there's generally less insecticide use, there's more, um, tends to be more organic and just better for the environment when you're planting it. Ways you can prevent uh, wildfires are by never starting a fire in an area where they are not permitted and never, ever, ever leave a fire unattended. Um, other things you can do are calculating your carbon footprint. Uh, you can do this on all sorts of websites. Uh, just Google it and you'll find a ton of different options. This can just help you to visualize where you're um, contributing to the most environmental degradation and where you can make the most changes to have a positive impact on the world. So yeah, that's pretty much all we're gonna talk about today for um, our wildlife neighbors. If anybody has any questions, you can reach out to me um, uh, at lauren.link at hinsdalehumanesociety.org. Just to give you guys a couple updates before we sign off for today, we have some really great news. A lot of you probably heard already on our social media, but Corn Dog, the dog who was missing for a while, he's back with us, he's safe and sound, he's resting in our offices right now. He's just getting rested up um, and getting some good food in him before he goes back up for adoption. And of course the vet is checking him out and he's doing great. Um, and then for the rest of October, we are remaining closed. Uh, if you're interested in adopting, you can check out our website. Look at all of our animals. If there's someone you're interested in, please fill out the application form on our website. Then just give us a call, leave a message about who you're interested in, and we'll give you a call back and do the whole interview process over the phone so you can schedule a time to come in and meet your potential new friend. Um, we'll be back for Humane Ed Live next Thursday. We'll be celebrating Mr. Putter's birthday. Um, if any of you know who Mr. Putter is, he's 
the star of a really cute book series that I read when I was a child and was reintroduced to, uh, to it by our old humane education manager, Jen. So shout out to Jen. Um, but yeah, so we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in.